Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Hayden, Minister of State of the Department of Agriculture, with specific responsibility for research and development, farm safety, and new market development. I greet you today on World Men's Day, and I'm delighted to introduce this special episode in this year's Tell Me About Civic Engagement Lecture Series, which focuses on rural health and wellness. As the First Minister with specific responsibility for farm safety and farm, farmer health and well-being, I am passionate about the measures we can take to ensure we all keep safe and well while going about our daily tasks. Too often in the past, farmers' own health and well-being has been overlooked, left at the bottom of a long list in a busy world. But how can we expect farmers to look after the crops and animals if they aren't looking after themselves? While looking after physical health and safety is very important, if we leave our mental health and well-being, we are overlooking another vital part. It's just as important that we all continue to have the conversations that are needed in this area. We need farmers and all men to look after themselves, to put their mental health, physical health and safety first. In working with the department and key stakeholders to highlight health, well-being and safety concerns, we want to ensure the farmers, when prioritising all the jobs on the farm, remember to prioritise themselves. We need farmers to realise that they are their farm's greatest, greatest, asset, greatest asset. I am honoured to be lending my support to this innovative collaborative initiative which brings together the expertise on Chagas, Trinity College Dublin and the ITs in Carlow and Letterkenny. World Men's Day, which has a particular emphasis on health, is marked in over 70 countries across the world. We are acutely aware in these times that mental health affects um, one in four of us throughout our life and is not gender specific. This evening you will hear interviews uh, carried out by Chagas advisors exploring key mental health issues. Billy Keane, the Listol based author and journalist, Paul Horan, an assistant professor of nursing in, uh, in the School of Nursing Midwifery in Trinity, will be interviewed about their mental health odysseys. We also will hear a presentation from Connor Hammersley, a PhD candidate from IT Carlow, outlining his PhD study on firm ground. Connor's research explores the development of a bespoke farmers' health training programme targeted agricultural advisors in Ireland. Phase one of his study is uh, completed and has explored the perspectives, needs and behaviours of the farming community. Dr Noel Richardson will also provide some context to Connor's research. I was delighted to recently help to launch on Firm Ground training programme, which has been part funded by the Department of Agriculture in conjunction with the Department of Health and the HSE. Building on Connor's research, it will help a train -to -trainer, uh, to develop a train -to trainer type programme for delivery nationally to farm advisors and to those who are in regular contact with farmers and agricultural workers. The target is to deliver this programme to 800 farm advisors over roughly a two year period. It is an exciting initiative which recognises the trusted relationship that the agricultural advisors have with farmers and builds on this to train advisors with the skills to take advantage of the opportunity that they get over the farm gate with the farmer. It will allow them to engage with farmers and signpost opportunities for supports where they are needed and I look forward to seeing the positive outcomes from this project. I'm delighted in particular to support this symposium during this global COVID-19 pandemic. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has had a huge impact and has presented additional challenges to all of us in sustaining our health and wellness. It is important that none of us at this time try to tackle physical and mental health issues alone. If you need help, help with health issues, please do not hesitate to contact your GP or to attend your local hospital. Our health service is still open for business despite the virus. It is important that we all reach out and find a listening ear. I hope you find the contributions to this symposium worthwhile. And I would like to introduce now Declan Doyle, Vice President of IT Carlow, who will outline some of the collaborative research projects that are occurring at present in the IT in Carlow in partnership with a variety of agencies in the agriculture and research sectors. I thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you. Hello. My name is Declan Doyle. I'm the Vice President for Development and Research at the Institute for Technology, Carlow. I would like to welcome you to the second symposium in the Tell Me About Pandemic Rural Health and Wellness series. 2020 has presented us all with many daunting new challenges and tests, indeed not least of which is the uninvited visitor to our lives that is the Corona-19 virus. We are delighted to be collaborating with our colleagues at Trinity College Dublin, Chagask and Letterkenny Institute of Technology to produce this symposium series of talks and presentations. Each symposium addresses a variety of health and wellness challenges faced by those of us living and working in rural communities through the prism of a global pandemic. 
Here in the Institute of Technology Carlo, we are adapting to new ways of working, learning and researching. Our primary focus is the safety and well-being of all our college community. Under current restriction levels, all lectures and tutorials have moved online across all campuses of the Institute. Practical, laboratory, studio and placement workshop classes continue to be delivered on campus in accordance with public health guidelines. With support from the Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science, we have put in place a comprehensive programme of supports for all of our college community. From the visible and obvious PPE and hand sanitising stations to the virtual supports for physical and mental health and spiritual and emotional wellness. We have COVID response teams overseeing our response to issues such as our teaching, learning and research, the learner experience, our physical environment and remote working. Our clubs and societies are operating to their maximum capacity to connect with our 9,000 students from over 90 different countries. Our Students' Union have launched a YouTube channel, SUTV, featuring videos on how to mind yourself during COVID-19, with help from the Frontline Emergency Services, as well as some local groups and organisations. How to eat healthy, how to cook five minute meals, gym workouts to do at home, and so on. Our research community have faced challenges in collecting data, connecting with peers, and publishing their findings. This symposia series is a good match for our institute. Through the National Centre for Men's Health, located here in college, we have worked on projects concerning our rural communities with partners including Chagask, Lanbia, the Irish Heart Foundation, the HSE, and UCD College of Health and Agricultural Sciences. Led by Dr. Noel Richardson, the centre seeks to raise the public profile of men's health issues and to contribute to effective and gender competent policy and practice in men's health in Ireland. While the symposium is a good match for our research capabilities, it is also a good fit for our technical capabilities. I would acknowledge the work of our TV and media production degree programme, led by Brendan Connolly, who have brought the series to our screens. We have seen some amazing community responses to the pandemic and to the different restrictions. National organisations and local authorities have reached out to the isolated members of our communities to support and assist and lend a welcoming, albeit socially distant, hand. I think of my own childhood. Growing up in my immediate locality in a rural part of southwest Wexford, we had five houses with almost 40 residents. Today there are six houses, but three are currently unoccupied and two of the others occupied by pensioners who have been cocooning since March. This scenario is replicated all over Ireland. Across the globe we have witnessed the heroic efforts of the magnificent men and women collectively referred to as our frontline workers. We have seen the level of effort and commitment throughout the health services doing great work in supporting patient care while putting themselves at risk. Each of us owe a debt of gratitude to all those who help the ill, who deliver essential services and who counsel our bereaved. These are challenging times for all of us, but together we will get past this. Scientists throughout the world are working hard to find treatments and vaccines, and there is every reason to believe that they will succeed. While we all wish that we could return to the type of campus life we enjoyed pre-COVID, this pandemic imposes new responsibilities upon all of us. We are grateful to all for taking on these responsibilities collectively and for approaching them with a high degree of determination, creativity and resilience. Tonight I'm joined in studio by Paul Horne, Professor of Nursing and Midwifery from Trinity College Dublin. Welcome Paul. Hello Claire, good evening. Um, how are you finding things in, in the world of academia, I suppose, during this strange time of COVID? Well, I, I never really thought that we'd start making nurses and midwives virtually. <laughs> uh, there used to be an ad years ago for, uh, I think it was for Insignia, and this fellow was thrown into a machine 
and he was washed and cleaned and his teeth brushed and hair and everything and he was turned out the other side of it completely washed. <clears throat> so I never thought, I never hoped that nursing would become a virtual endeavour, certainly from an academic or teaching point of view. But of course, as our nurses are not virtual in reality in COVID-19, yeah. or our midwives, they're on the front line, um, <clears throat> and they're being among the most infected people with this horrible disease. Um, even some of my own shooties have been affected uh, by COVID, and we don't know in the long term how that will affect anybody, really. Okay, very good. And I suppose then there's the whole mental aspect to being on the front line as well, Paul. It is, um, and I've been running a, a module in Trinity for 15 years now called Reflective Practice, which is really about teaching nurses and midwives how to think about all these really challenging experiences that they have, and think about them in, in safe ways, um, and not in ways that would challenge their mental health. And we're forever encouraging them to seek whatever supports they need, you know, to deal with these really, really challenging situations. But, you know, COVID is like no other virus that we've ever witnessed. Yeah. It's a 100-year event and um, it's challenging. I think there is some good news about COVID. I think um, the death numbers are not as high as they were in the first surge. Um, but it's early days, yes. And I'm hoping that lockdown will help. Uh, numbers have dropped today again, I think, to yeah. 720. Um, but it's going to be a long winter and a very different one for everybody. Exactly. And Paul, I suppose, just honing back in on the mental health issues, have you yourself experienced mental health issues at any stage during your career? I have. Um, last year I would have spoken World, World Men's Health Day about um, the Bipolar Express. Um, I myself suffered from bipolar for most of my life. I uh, wasn't diagnosed until my early 40s, uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and suffered with extreme mania and extreme uh, depression, um, uh, extreme highs and extreme lows. Um, and, you know, I was in denial a lot of the time, um, but eventually with some really good help uh, from my colleagues, from an excellent psychiatrist um, and from a circle of friends, um, I decided to get treatment. Um, and for the first time, it was mostly medication. And then after that, then uh, sleep was a huge problem. I was a bit like Maggie Thatcher. I hate to mention that woman's name in public, but I never slept maybe for two or three hours a night. Um, and it's not good for your health at all. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's many people out there tonight with sleep disturbances, whether they be for psychological or physical reasons. Um, so I did go and get the assistance, um, and then I had another um, extreme bout uh, about five years ago, and I took myself to the John of God Hospital in Dublin, um, and I had a proper uh, medical work down. Um, uh, but the most important part of that treatment was to get a, not only medical intervention, but a thing called a RAP programme. Uh, rap is spelled not as in the rap music, it's spelled W-R-A-P, and that's a Wellness Recovery Action Programme. Okay. And I'd really encourage anybody out there with mental health, yes, medication is really important, and some people will need to be on medication for all their lives, but I think it's a combination approach, and the rap programme helps the, the individual with mental health issues to take control of their lives, and it creates a, a, a daily programme of being. Um, it's structured um, and it really helps. It also looks at your triggers and things that you shouldn't do that might challenge your mental health. Okay. Um, but it may, it's changed my life completely. It's, it really has. Um, and I'm just so grateful to have, you know, a rap program. I think everybody probably should have a COVID rap program to get through the physical and mental challenges that uh, are placed upon us. I think the greatest challenge is probably a lack of social connectivity yeah. for everybody. Real social connectivity, not the virtual stuff, which is really helpful and it's all we've got at the moment. So, you know, I suppose I'm a very lucky person. Yeah. Um, I, I always wanted to get well. Maybe my, my luck was born out of the fact that I'm a poet and a writer um, and I kind of always saw being a bit mad as a badge of honour, I suppose. Most of the great writers are all a bit crazy. Spike Milligan is one of my heroes. Um, but for anybody out there, you know, reach out, you know, pick up the telephone, use WhatsApp, connect with people. Yeah. The research tells us that it's connectivity that is the greatest enabler of good mental health. And Paul, I suppose bearing in mind that we're living in this virtual world with COVID at the moment, how do you think it's affecting, especially the first year students maybe, their first time away from home in college? Well, a lot of them haven't got away from home, have yeah. they? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're having university or college experiences in their sitting room, their bedrooms, you know, uh, wherever. Uh, you know, it's, it's something they'll never forget. It's not quite the, there's no, there's no clubs, yeah. you know, there's no freshers weeks. 
Um, but my main worry is their connectivity. And, um, but I feel a little bit reassured from some of the tutorials that I've done that they're creating WhatsApp groups, they're creating FaceTime groups, but it, it's not real. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's all very, very much virtual. Um, the difference, I suppose, for nursing and midwifery students is they will actually be going out on the wards in the middle of this pandemic. Okay. And I think that some of these nurses will be some of the most, and midwives, some of the most remarkable nurses we'll ever see. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I suppose just following on then, how do you think we can each as individuals and as communities promote and nurture, um, you know, positive mental health in the coming months? Well, I kind of thought about this um, and I thought, well, seeing as I have a rap programme, I thought I'd share maybe a COVID rap programme okay. with people. And I've kind of called it uh, Getting Through COVID Lockdown by Being Hopeful. And hopeful is like an acronym. Okay. So the first thing is having a structured daily routine, for example, and keeping yourself organised in as many ways as possible. Regular meal times, health and diet, um, reduce snacks and get regular sleeping habits get, uh, with regard to going to bed and getting up. Always for the outdoors. I know the weather's not going to be great, but I think we were quite lucky you know, for some of the time with exactly. COVID, the weather was good. Get out, get some fresh air. Uh, P is for physical exercise. There's loads of really good physical exercise things, even for those who can't go outside yeah. on the telly. Um, e is for enjoyment. Do something you enjoy every day. Okay. Um, F is for fun. Try and create a sense of fun. You know, watch the comedy channel. Do something, laugh yeah. at least once a day. U is for unplug. I think we all need to unplug the phone, the Sky News, the Facebook, the WhatsApp, you know, for periods during exactly, the day. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think L is for learning. I think challenge yourself to learn a new skill. Um, and maybe we've all had enough of the COVID diet the first time. Maybe not cooking. Maybe do something else that's not going to affect your waistline. N is for the news. I would recommend watching it sparingly at the moment because it's rarely good. Okay. Uh, e is for entertainment. There's plenty of concerts and arts and all sorts of good things on the telly. Sleep, please try and maintain your sleep pattern. It's really important. And the risk, with lack of routine, that can be affected. Yeah. And the final S is for self-care. Bathing and showering, there's nothing like a bit of pampering to lift your spirits, even in these times. So I would say, you have to work on your sense of hopefulness. It could have huge benefits to you at this time on the COVID odyssey. Stay safe, stay apart, wash your hands, wear your mask, because it's Halloween every day and we get a vaccine. Excellent, very good. So we're back to the basics, Paul, of washing the hands and doing all the Absolutely. basics right. Okay, um, and I suppose just to finish up there then, um, if you could give maybe a small bit of positivity or how people can, you know, reinforce positive mental health over the next couple of months, what, would you, what advice would you give to people watching tonight? Well, I, I, I've written a, a wee poem of hope. Okay. Because I think hope is the most important thing for anyone's mental health. So I'm going to share this with you. Dream hopefully. There will be a post-COVID world. Life will be different for a while. Unpredictable, maybe. Life at the moment is not what it seems. But it doesn't mean we can't have dreams. So even during COVID, they dream hopefully. Dare to hope. It will, it, it will help you to cope. Dare not to let COVID rip reality seam by seam, dare to change your appearance. Even if the barbers and the hairdressers aren't open, that could be quite an interesting thing to do. Dare to believe in yourself. Dare to place disbelief on a well-made shelf. Dare to be brave and see that this virus will leave us, this too will pass. Dare to hope and together we'll all learn to cope. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That was some lovely advice that you have for people tonight. So I suppose, that's the end of our interview with Paul and we'd like to thank Paul for um, giving us an insight into how he has dealt with mental health over the years. Hi, I'm Dr Noel Richardson. I am Director of the National Centre for Men's Health at IT Carlo. I'm delighted to introduce you to a really exciting, innovative research programme in Farmers Health called On Firm Ground and to PhD student Conor Hammersley, who will talk to you in more detail about the programme shortly. Just by way of context, the National Centre for Men's Health has been working closely with Chagask and other partners in the farming industry and farmers' health for a number of years now. 
We know that farmers face significant challenges in relation to their health. And we also know that agricultural advisors are uniquely and strategically positioned to support farmers on a range of issues, including potentially health issues. So our main focus in this study was to explore the potential for ag advisors to assume a type of health champion or health connector role. Not it should be said to assume the role of health professionals, but rather to signpost and connect farmers to services and supports, to normalise and mainstream conversations on health into routine interactions with farmers, and to be a link or bridge in terms of connecting farmers to services and programmes locally. So Connor will describe in more detail the first phase of this study, findings from discussion groups with farmers, ag advisors and others about how this might work in practice. Just to conclude, from my perspective, I really want to acknowledge the highly innovative partnership model that underpinned this study. To my knowledge, this is the first study to be co-funded by the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. Other parties include the HSC, Chagask, WIT, the Men's Development Network and ourselves here in IT Cargo. And because a project such as this inevitably straddles policy, research and practice, I think the nexus or catalyst for bringing these domains together and bringing the project to life essentially has been this unique partnership model. So, onwards and upwards. The beauty of Ireland's landscape is legendary and predominantly an agricultural one and farmers have been its gatekeepers for generations. Traditionally, farm safety has dominated farmers' health literature and for good reason. This project, titled On Firm Ground, developing a national farmers' health training programme targeted at agricultural advisors in Ireland, aims to broaden out that focus to a more holistic focus on mental and physical well-being. So in brief, this is about training up agricultural advisors who meet farmers on a regular basis to equip them with the skills and competencies to be able to engage with farmers on topics associated with mental and physical health. So my name is Connor Hammersley and I'm the PhD researcher on this study. And the background of this project is that there is a substantial body of evidence that suggests farmers experience a disproportionate burden of health problems particularly in relation to mental health problems, as farming is one of the highest occupations associated with suicide. Additionally, due to the isolated nature of farming, farmers are seen as a hard to reach group. A key asset that we have is that agricultural advisors are uniquely positioned to support farmers on health issues. And our findings suggest that although they report encountering health problems, particularly in relation to mental health problems, they feel ill-equipped in their capacity to engage with farmers on these matters. So our study is broken into four distinct phases and the first phase of that, which I am going to discuss in this presentation, is an exploration study of farmers and other key stakeholders' experiences and perspectives in relation to farmers' health and help-seeking behaviour and to provide clear, actionable recommendations to inform the design of the training programme. The title of this study is the most important cog in the wheel, prioritising farmers' health through a national training programme. And this quote, the most important cog in the wheel, was a quote from a focus group participant and it was used in the context that farmers had lost sight of this. They had lost sight of the fact that their health is the most integral aspect to the overall welfare of the farm and rather their inbuilt mindset was to soldier on and stay strong in the face of adversity and put everything else above looking after themselves as illustrated in the following comment by one female farmer. You know, there was this conscious thing. If I was going to get my hair done, I was selfish. To go to the doctor to check something out, I was selfish, you know, because maybe you're only looking after yourself and not thinking of other things. The findings of this study are based on the analysis of the focus groups that we conducted with farmers, different farming organisations, agricultural advisors and spouses of farmers. So what did we find? Our findings are broken into four distinct themes. The first one is in relation to farming, rural masculinity and identity. And this is against the backdrop of farming being a male dominated occupation and traditional masculine norms standing in the way of farmers engaging in their health. Our findings suggest that farmers identity revolved around the farmer as a hard worker battling against environmental and economic obstacles and exerting his authority over the natural landscape. 
all the while suppressing emotions and help-seeking behaviour. There was a sense that real farmers don't ask for help, that seeking help was like an admission of failure and had an emasculating effect on the traditional norms that farmers felt they had to live up to, with one male farmer saying, I would say the old perception of we are hardy and we are men and we are okay, we don't have problems, that's the perception. There was relational aspects of farming and rural masculinity, whereby the female of the household was seen as the custodian of farmer's health, and this would defer responsibility away from the farmer when engaging with health. Health was seen as female business, and not something hard-working men had time to engage with. The second key theme was in relation to wrestling with the challenges to autonomy and control within farming. Succession and inheritance was, was repeatedly referenced, as a key stressor in the focus groups with farmers. A number of tensions bubbled under the surface, not least the insecurity and lack of autonomy associated with not knowing if or when the farm might pass from one generation to the next. Changing farming roles and increased paperwork, and farmers struggling to keep up with this, particularly felt amongst dairy farmers, who had increased in, in the scale of their farm, and older farmers, who were struggling with the evolving nature of farming from a physically labour-intensive role to more and more administration work. It was felt that farmers were being held to account more and more by regulatory authorities, with one farmer saying, Before, as long as a fellow was good with a brush, shovel and four-grade fork, he classed himself as a farmer. But now it is an office job. Everything is more accountable now, and it all comes with deadlines. And if we don't meet them, we are severely penalised. Older farmers especially, they are terrified to make any mistake. The third key theme was in relation to isolation and the broader demise of rural communities. The unravelling of mehel in rural communities, that sense of mutual support and communal way of working, which were once the traditional hallmarks of a rural community had been lost. There was a perception in many of the focus groups that everyone was simply too busy to be helping one another out, with one agricultural advisor saying, Before, it used to be over and back with farmers helping each other out and pooling machinery. All that is gone now. Lads are just too busy nowadays to be helping each other out. And that has really affected farmers' mental health. Added to this was the growing concerns in relation to isolation and the subsequent feeling of loneliness that came with this. Isolation was associated with a loss of perspective, as the isolated farmer did not have anyone or anywhere to unburden his or her difficulties. As a result, problems did not just remain unresolved, but rather intensified, festered and became amplified over time. And the last key theme is in relation to defining a health role for advisors, roles, responsibilities and boundaries. Firstly, there was a strong feeling among advisors that they have an inherent duty of care to farmers, and there was a strong sense that they could play a more holistic and meaningful role in terms of not only helping farmers with the welfare of their farm, but also engage with farmers on the welfare of their health. In relation to some of the obstacles that advisors alluded to in assuming a health role, as you can imagine, there was a feeling of apprehension or a fear in relation to broaching health topics with farmers, particularly in relation to mental health. Finally, in relation to minding the minders, advisors described their own vulnerability in relation to being exposed to potentially sensitive or intimate situations, which in the absence of training, they would feel ill-equipped to be able to deal with. So just to conclude, and some of the considerations deriving from this study, it is important to understand and acknowledge the role identity and masculinity plays when engaging farmers on health topics. It is also important to understand that farmers are not a homogenous group, that they vary in terms of geographical location, farming enterprise, age profile, gender and marital status, and all these variables will implicate in diverse ways with farmers and their relationship with health. From my experience, a key aspect of engaging with farmers on health is on creating a safe space and empathising with the world of farmers. In all the discussion groups that I conducted with farmers in relation to health topics, I never came away feeling that farmers don't engage with this stuff. Rather, I came away from all the discussion groups with a feeling that if the safe space is created for farmers, they're more than willing to open up and share their story. And that is the challenge, creating that space. Granted, I used the word farmer throughout this presentation, but solely identifying these people by their occupation does not do them justice. 
They are family members and they are community members. They are part of our sports clubs, our tidy towns teams and other rural organisations. They are the people we meet down the local shop. They are the very essence and fabric of a rural community. And too often these people, particularly men, fall ill or more severely pass away due to the fact that they are not comfortable in going for a health check or feel it is not the manly thing to do to talk about some of the difficulties and emotions that they are dealing with. Farming is one of the highest occupations associated with suicide and that is the impetus for this study to understand and break down the barriers associated with farmers engaging with their health. Finally I would just like to say a special thanks to all the farmers, farming organisations, agricultural advisors and spouses of farmers who took part in this study and shared their experiences and stories with me. Without them this study would not have been possible. Hello, my name is Michael Summers, and tonight I am joined by publican, author, journalist, honorary corpsman, but true son of the kingdom, Billy Keane. You're welcome. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be with you. No, no problem at all, Billy. One of the things I would have seen and maybe observed with yourself over the years is the positivity that you bring when you walk into a room. That did not come from some place. It obviously came from your town, Listowel, and your surrounding area there. What does Listowel mean to you, and how have you seen it evolve over the years? Yeah, there's a great lift in living in a small town. Um, you, you know most people, and you just walk down the street, and they give you a bit of a lift, you know. And then I suppose the pub. You know, we rare to talk to people in the pub. I was a barman since I was about as of age and you can see a good few years later I'm still a barman. So you naturally are taught how to talk to people. Um, in the town itself I remember I was in all kinds of trouble exactly 28 years ago. Uh, I started working in the bar 28 years ago on the 1st of November. But I remember walking down the town and people just giving you such a lift. You know, they know you're a bit down and they'll have a quiet word and a bit of a laugh, lift you up. And you kind of feel, you know, you, you, you think that everyone is looking at you, but sure, they all have troubles of their own. Every single person watching this has some bit of troubles of their own, and I have troubles. There's a secret that I discovered a long time ago, and that is, if the good times don't last forever, then neither will the bad, and it goes. And I, I was in terrible trouble one time, and I was in despair, but to, Oh, and it will if you have the patience and the whole and then when you can feel a bit better say to yourself, Geez, I'm glad now that I that I that I can go on, you know. Um th th there's a there's a saying really that makes a lot. Um it's, it's it's got to do with what you tell yourself. Okay. So your thoughts are basically what you feed it. You could be talking about it yourself and you'll be saying, But I so drunk, you know, what I did there or whatever. But I, I have something that I picked from MASH TV series. And in MASH, the helicopters fly in, and it says, on the tannoy, it says, incoming wounded. And I treat those negative thoughts that way. So when they start coming at you, I keep saying, incoming wounded, incoming wounded, and I warn them to stop. Do you know what, Michael, I can be myself half the time. I might be fighting with anyone else at all. And the worries of the world, especially late at night, they can take every night. And save me, incoming wounded, and I just stop pity. Don't be telling yourself. It's what you think it makes you. I want to say, and that's that's kind of. The other thing I say about it is, is you know, you have to put on. What's my mother? You, my mother had a great expression. We'd be in the kitchen at the back of the pub there. You know, we were rare, mm. born and rare in the pub. You know, um, you've been in it, I know. And um, we were like the chickens, free range kids, wandering in and out the whole time. And at the kitchen then, you know, my mom would be in there. I remember she was seriously pregnant. I'd say she was 18 months pregnant because she was <laughs> here. And she had the morning sickness. I might get it myself sometimes, mm. morning sickness. But yeah. she couldn't do the pub anyway. And she said to me, I was a bar man at about 10. And she was in a desperate state. Dad was upstairs writing and he was wanted peace and quiet. And he was demented. Uh, at trying to write the field and the wants pieces and my mothers whom I loved dearly were playing football with me in the kitchen. It was mayhem. When I came into the pub there was a knock 
and my mom says, get out there, Bill. And she says, Bill, shop face. Now, what shop face is you, you're in the kitchen, you're frightened and going mad. You go out to that counter and you go, and hello, my God, and love to see you. you. build yourself up into good form. Mm. What happens after Bill is that you just stay in good form and it becomes part of who you are. It sneaks up in you to good form almost imperceptibly or subconsciously. Um, your mother was a remarkable woman, very practical. Uh, do you see that you have many of her traits? I, I have um, a lot of her traits in that um, I, I'd be tough enough when it comes down to it, but I, I hope I have a softer side. But as regards the practicalities of life, my mother was lucky as a hit. I'm a bit of a dreamer, uh, and at times I forget stuff, and it's a constant battle for me to, to, to be efficient. Yeah. I have to work every day, but I'm better at it, and you get it by just practicing. So say if you're down the farm and you're after making you got to turn something off or you lose gallons of milk or something happens, well, it's a learning experience. So what you do is you say, I won't do that the next time, and you don't, and... Sometimes you lose, but you win. Like, if you look at it that way, when things go wrong, that's actually the best day you ever were. The day something goes wrong is the best day you ever are because then you know what you have to do and you're fighting and you're kicking up and you're trying your best to get back to where you were. I kind of see this whole COVID-19 shutdown as a challenge, you know, to reinvent myself, reinvent the bar. Um, I found the last one. The first lockdown, I didn't, I didn't do well at all. And I was, you know, I was writing for years about positivity and everything, and I didn't do it right because I didn't go about it right. It was a bit of a shock to the system. I give myself that much, but I kind of went into it and I didn't have a plan, and I was kind of on the bar, and I'd be looking at the four walls. And one night I was, I went down and I did something I never do. I had a few drinks in my own, and the next thing is I started singing. I can't sing, but sang and a few bars of a song. And you know what it was? Even just as the as it was on, it lifted me up. And I said to myself, and I made a huge decision. And I think it was one of the most important decisions I've ever made in my life. And I said to myself, you know, it's easier, far easier to be happy than to be sad. Yes. If you think about it, like happy is a good, like a, there's no repercussion happy, but there are for being sad. So, like, if you're, and I know some of us can't help it, and I get the blues myself, God, that's, that's a given. But most of the time I get over it by saying it's easier to be happy than sad. And if you think about it, being sad, you're in bad old form, you're worrying, you're, you're not asleep, and you lose your, uh, you, you know, you might, you, you might not even want to, to make love to your beautiful partner. In life, you might everything kind of, but if you think about it, isn't it way to put on the shop face? Like, if I make a choice of the, the hardest thing in the world to be, and that is depressed, it's so hard. And I know some people can't help it, and I'm with you 100%. But just that, like, it's easier to be happy than sad. And it might be a little small bit, you know. So, so you would have evolved different tools over the last maybe six, seven months at this stage? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it, 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 it evolved. I suppose a good a good walk as well if you can manage it. The last lockdown there was days I couldn't walk and it was beautiful weather. Do you remember the weather, Mike? No, it was super, know, yeah. Like I was the only pale person. I was the only pale person in North Kerry during this because I just I kind of I, I let it get the better of me and but I found a way. You will find a way, you know. When you're a bit down and out, it actually you find out a bit more about yourself and you find and you kind of know instinctively that this is going to bail you out a bit and it's. It's not as hard as people think if you just kind of keep it simple. Feed yourself good thoughts. Of bad ones come in, say, it's like someone from the pub. You say to someone, get out that door, you know. Uh, the other part of it then was, you know, I, I used to get a lot of criticism, mostly online, being independent or television or whatever. And I used to let it get to me a bit. But sometimes it was humorous in fairness. The one I'd put up a post and he had that Billy Keane, he says, I think... John B. must have taken the wrong baby home from the hot. <laughs> so you didn't show me that. Then someone said to me one time, you, you, you have those people who were very critical. And I says, yeah. And, and he said, this man said to me, he says, well, if they were outside the pub and you were doing a bit of after hours, would you invite them in for a drink? 
So that's what we do after hours. But anyway, we weren't doing it. Would you invite? And I said, I would not invite him. I wouldn't let him inside the door. Well, then he said, why so are you letting them into your head? Yes. And it makes perfect sense. So like a lot of people I know will have kind of, they'll have a bit of angst towards someone or whatever, and they'll be ruling. You know, there could be two people in the room, you and the person you're thinking about, who's taking over the space in your head with rent for your property. So forget them. Don't let them in. You know? One of the things I would have noticed about your pub over the years, and no doubt you missed it, but to me your pub was more of a rambling house where you go in as a stranger it was. and it was. You, you could come out proposing to somebody. And it happened, it happened all the time. Um, yeah, we've had several marriages, a few divorces, <laughs> mostly marriages. People propose or they met in the pub and we get them coming back. Uh, and then we have great sing songs, you know, the sing songs are, are awesomely brilliant. Uh, Mickey McConnell, who wrote Only Our Rivers Run Free, is kind of one of our stars, and Gabriel Fitzmaurice, the poet, Owen Hand, and then random singers come in. We don't have uh, we don't have Wi-Fi, that's why I'm doing it here in the sitting room. You know, us. And of course, you have wall. the Doris the Day is... moment as well, Billy, don't you? The, the Black Hills of Dakota, and to the me... Black Hills of Dakota, well, it... there's a way, I just want to say something about this wall, this is a cream wall. There's not one bit of cream in our pub. I can't bear cream. It's the most boring colour of all time. And the whole country is painted in cream. Like It's like it is like as if the cream paint was a quarter of the price or something. So that's why I'm not, in the pub it's all greens and reds and vivid colours and uh, blues and the, the primary colours. But So that's why I have to apologise for the cream wall here behind me. Yeah, the Black Hills of Dakota is a very special song to us. And we sing it at the end of good night. And because the national anthem causes a lot of trouble, can cause a lot of trouble, we sing the Black Hills. Uh, and it's, uh, take me back to the Black Hills, the Black Hills of Dakota, to the beautiful Indian country that I love. So I can actually hear my dad singing. He was able to sing. It's, and it's, it's... we hold hands. And, and then we sang it. We sang it at my mom's grave. Uh, we sang it at my dad's grave. We sang it. One of the customers died lately, and there was only a few of us there. Um, Oliver O'Neill, lovely man. Uh, I did the oration. Um, but there was only a few people allowed in, but we sang it anyway. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And because he, he would have loved it. That would have been his. That would have been his parting glass. You know. It, it, it's it's a beautiful thing, and like Listall is a wonderful place. To me, looking at it, one of the collaborators on this project is Trinity College. And Brendan Kennelly would have been from down your part of the world as well, a remarkable man, a remarkable poet. Um, and I noticed any time yeah. I would have been down there, I would have read some of his poetry on the wall. You did, you did, Michael, yeah. We have it up in the wall. Um, Brendan Kennelly, he's, he's still to the good. Uh, he's living just outside the town now. He has to be looked after. What an incredible brain and what an incredible man and a great sense of humour, you know. I remember one time I was going for a walk on the beach in Belly Bunyan and Brendan was there. He was like a he was like a seal. He loved to swim, you know, because he came from Belly Longford on the Shannon Estuary there. And he was well used to the water. And he came out of the water and he was gleaming, you know, the water was falling off of him and, and he turned on, he says, Bill, he says, Look out there. So we looked out we looked out towards America because that was it. And he says, Look at that, he says, Look at that sea there, he says. And not a first bush between here and Manhattan. Do you know that, was, that Wonderful. came straight out? Yeah, but uh, there's a poem. Uh, um, have we much more time there, Michael? But I, um, I, well, I think we have about a there. minute there. So um, yeah, give we, us the poem there. Get, I have to put on the glasses for this one. But uh, this is Brendan's famous poem, "Begin," and I think it's very apt at the moment. You know, to begin. You know, it's never too late to begin, no matter how down you are. I've been at the bottom, like I've been hanging on. I've been hanging on to the cliff, but my nails, but out of it, you know, and with help from my friends and family and a little bit of, little bit of love. Anyway, here's begin. I, I, I just, uh, in case I forget something, I moved the book there. Begin again to the summoning birds, to the sight. Begin to the roar of morning traffic all along Pembroke Road. Every beginning is a process born in light and dying in dark. Determination and exaltation of springtime, flooring the way to work, begin to the pageant of June girls, the arrogantness of swans in the canal, bridges linked past that future, 
old friends passing to with us begin the loneliness that cannot end since it perhaps is when they begin begin to wonder at our own faces at crying birds in the sudden rain at branches stark in the willing sunlight at seagulls foraging for bread at couples sharing a sunny secret alone together while making good do we live in a world that dreams of ending that always seems about to give in something that will not acknowledge conclusion insists that we forever begin dash is just a wonderful piece of writing and it definitely sums up a day like today as in World's Men's Mental Health Day. Billy, just to say on behalf of Chagas Trinity College, IT Carlo and Leather Kenny, thank you very much for a wonderful insight into how to deal with issues that indeed we all face on a day-to-day -day basis and some people unfortunately think they have to face them alone. So thank you very much. Thank you, a great honour to be asked. That is the end of the second programme of the Tell Me About series. For anyone experiencing any difficulties, remember to please talk. But the most important thing is to say something when you talk. If you are the chosen one to listen, please listen with a welcoming ear. Remember, keep active, keep positive. We are all unique. To finish off tonight's episode, we are going to the foothills of Schlievenamon, to Crook and Oer, where John Birmingham has written a song for tonight. So to play us out, John will give us the happy song. Good night, stay safe. This is a happy song I'm singing and it's for all of you. I hope you can feel the sun is shining. I want it to shine for you. Feel the sun is shining. I wanted to shine.